Good afternoon uh, to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us to open the webinar today. We are going to talk about almost everything in express way. So we want to show how to install the software, how the software is built from modules, how to configure, how the uh, graphical unit, uh, graphical um, interface uh, is to, um, designed, how to configure NAS and iSCSI. Even we want to show a short iSCSI failover. We want to show volume replication. We want to show data replication as, as it is in our agenda today. And we want to talk about the best practices with the software. Okay, so let us switch to another PC I have prepared already. Good, so uh, for today's session, as you see, I have prepared uh, two servers with uh, DSS and also as a client uh, Windows 2008 virtual machine, which is running on the Xen server uh, this time. Mostly we were using uh, VMware, but this time we will use the uh, Xen server. So that's the chart, but maybe the chart I will show on this PC, it's bigger. Uh, okay. Ah, that's the quick start. I thought I was having the chart as well. Okay, I have it here. So, we have a first server which is uh, accessed by IP address 192.168.0.230. That's the ETH0. Okay, the same thing on the right side but 240. And to make it easy, we just use subnet 0, 1, 2, 3. And uh, for iSCSI failover, we will use uh, two virtual IP addresses. So it is a bit more complicated installation this, than as usual, because as usual, we are using just one regular, one uh, virtual IP. This time we have uh, on ETH1 and on ETH2, we have a virtual IP address. And this is 192.168.10.250 and 20.250. Okay, so the storage client that's here. In our case, uh, this is a Xen server, but it can be anything else. Uh, we have configured uh, initiator and the Xen server at the 10.251 and 20.200 uh, path for the storage. What is important in iSCSI failover uh, configuration that we need so-called ping nodes. The ping nodes uh, are the nodes in the network which uh, this cluster can check whether it is uh, all these nodes are reachable. This will help us to decide about failover in case of network problems. So the minimum number of uh, ping nodes is one piece, but in case of uh, multipath, let's say we should have one ping node per uh, one subnet. So let's say in subnet 192.168.1, we should have one ping node and another ping node, we should have 192.168.2. But if we are really careful, we should have maybe two ping nodes in every subnet. And in our case, it will be already four ping nodes. So I have 192.168.1, let's say 106, and the IP in net, uh, and the network, and the one, um, 107, so next one. I can have even more, but uh, don't exaggerate. Uh, I will say one is minimum, and the two, three, four, it's a good idea to have. And maybe you ask a question, uh, have so many uh, hosts uh, to, uh, to assign such a ping node. So this is very easy. You can uh, assign extra IP alias. You can do it in Windows. You can do it in Linux uh, to any network interface. 
So your network interface, let's say, will be in subnet zero, and you can assign one more uh, IP address to the network card, which is in subnet one and subnet two, for example. Okay. Good. So now we know what kind of configurations we have. Then we can start to uh, talk about the hardware uh, which uh, we have prepared today. So we have two different servers. The first one is an uh, entry-level server which with a hardware rate controller. Okay, we have Arica hardware rate controller here. There is a few hard disks installed in the RAID 5. Okay, that's, you see we have, I have few hard disks in the RAID 5. And uh, second uh, server, uh, I'm just running software 8. Okay. So you see, it is not really important that both servers are identical, but it is also possible that uh, the servers are running different hardware, and even uh, one is running hardware 8, another one is running software 8. Uh, I would like to say a few words about the GUI. Here you see the first server uh, shows uh, DSS 230, and the second server shows DSS 240. Okay, uh, that's the uh, host. That's the server name. Okay, the server name you configure here in the setup and network interfaces in this menu, and same on the primary server. You see, this name is shown here, exactly. Good, so now we can identify servers very easy. Uh, I was promising you to talk about uh, how the uh, graphical um, uh, interface is uh, designed. Uh, so let us talk a few words a, um, a bit about it. So we have a setup, we have configuration, maintenance, status and help. So, under setup, we have everything what is related to network settings, administrator um, uh, permissions and settings, passwords, and all the hardware. And how we organize the storage pools to the, our storage operating system. So that's the storage, storage source. It can be a local hardware rate or maybe more than one hardware rate. It can be local software rate. It can be external a fiber channel uh, storage, which is connected to uh, HBA, which is installed in the system over the initiator. It can be external iSCSI uh, target, which is um, connected over built-in iSCSI initiator. Uh, here, hardware, it's uh, uh, some settings about, let's say, like uninterruptible power supply, time, um, of course, NTP server. Um, this is very important to have the time uh, running proper because in many cases this is uh, critical. For example, a Kerberos tickets uh, by default uh, can tolerate only five minutes difference. So if the, uh, if the time difference between um, DSS and uh, Active Directory will be more than five minutes, you will lose, uh, users will lose uh, uh, connection to the uh, shares. So um, you can't ignore these settings, it, it must be uh, done properly, okay? In configuration, uh, there is opposite thing. Uh, we already uh, have the, uh, the services which are organizing the storage into v logical volumes, volume groups, and uh, all these NAS protocols uh, with the settings for these protocols. Then we have also Sun, like um, iSCSI target or fiber channel target settings. So here we organize uh, how the storage will be exported to the network. In maintenance, uh, we have some things like snapshot, um, backup, we can maintain connections because we can uh, uh, reset connections. Of course, we can schedule shutdown or shutdown at once. 
then we can fix like a backup restore antivirus, then the save and restore the settings. In miscellaneous, all these settings which we uh, uh, have done here, we can save anytime and we uh, divide this to two uh, kind of uh, type of settings. First type, it is what you have done on the setup button and the second under configuration button, okay? You can save locally on the RAID, or you can also download uh, this file to your PC, okay? When you just click, then we will see that the new settings is already coming, and I have clicked download, so I'm, I'm getting the settings as well. Good. Okay, uh, last autosave, it means every reboot we also automatically save the settings. Okay, in the old one you can just click here and delete if you don't need. Okay, good. So that's the maintenance. In the status, we have uh, plenty um, very practical information about the hardware and the system, about the running tasks. Uh, in the hardware, uh, very important function. If you want to check or something is wrong and you are interested about more settings than you see on the GUI, then you can click on download and the download will uh, collect all the logs from the system. Uh, so there is a uh, plenty information about the system and during uh, uh, collecting the logs, uh, we are also running plenty different uh, Linux uh, programs which are checking uh, the speed, for example. We run HDPARM, which is checking the local read speed of your uh, RAID or um, disks or fiber channel RAID array which you have connected. So all these so-called storage units will be tested during uh, we are downloading the logs. Okay. And in the help, we have just, uh, just about, okay, the logs are already there. You see we have a serial number, build number, and the t when the logs were uh, collected, okay? So we can just save the file somewhere in our in local uh, PC, and then if uh, need, you can forward this when you create ticket. Okay, I see already the first questions. Okay, RAID 5. Is RAID 5 more common than RAID 10 in this kind of scenario? Ooh. Mostly uh, people, of course, uh, uh, want maximum capacity. So RAID 10, as you know, uh, give you only 50% of your available disk capacity. So in RAID 10 is used uh, mostly when you uh, don't care about capacity, you care about performance and uh, high reliability, then RAID 10 is a um, good choice. But I will say uh, if you care about reliability, looks like RAID 6 uh, statistically has an even higher reliability than RAID 10. Uh, because uh, in RAID 10, uh, if uh, two disks from the same uh, mirror pair uh, will die, so you will lose all the um, data. In case of RAID 6, uh, any two disks uh, can die and you still have, uh, you can still read your data. Okay, the next question, how implemented failover? Yeah, we will, uh, we will talk about uh, in a few minutes. If the servers are different IP addresses. Okay. This, this we will talk about it as well. Uh, next question, OS Linux. Is OS Linux what kernel version? Uh, currently we are using uh, 2.6.27 uh, and we will switch soon to 2.6.32 or 35. Uh, it is still not, not decided. Okay, next question. What um, AV vendors can you integrate? Uh, if you mean antivirus, then we integrate CLAM FV. Okay. Okay, let us uh, come back to the session and then I will come back to the question in a in few minutes. Good, so that was the GUI 
And I was also, uh, I had also put on the schedule, uh, uh, on the schedule uh, how to, uh, how to install the software. Okay, so let me go to the uh, user portal. So when you register to our OpenE web uh, user portal, when you log in, then you will have the uh, area with your products and then free trial. The free trial is the uh, place when you download all the latest builds. So probably you notice already that we have a, uh, the build available as an ISO file and the a, a same available as a zip file. Actually, both are uh, both are the same. The only difference is that with ISO we have built in the uh, software for uh, available to to boot at once from CD, for example. Or um, ISO is also good if you want if you are installing a, a virtual machine. Uh, in uh, they need uh, in such case ISO file. So using ISO file you can at once install uh, a virtual machine. If you just need uh, uh, to prepare a so-called pen drive with the installation um, software, then you can download zip and unpack and copy this on any USB stick. And when you start it, then you can uh, select the installer and the installer will place the software on your wish destination. Here you have also quick start. And uh, I have also uh, the quick start on my desktop. Mm. Okay. I have it here. Okay. So please download the quick start and please read the quick start. In the quick start, uh, there is uh, all this information you need to install the software and to start in very short form, probably four, yes, exactly four small pages. And that which you need to uh, have in, in uh, so the most basic knowledge you need to have in order to create a share or create the iSCSI target and start to use the software, okay? So, uh, okay, when you are here, just click and download the uh, quick start. Of course, uh, you can download and read the manual, but this is more, more, much more bulky document. Good, so we already know the difference between ISO and, uh, and the zip file. I can also demonstrate you have the zip file, you can just copy on your, on any stick. I have it here even on my PC and okay but I have some problem with accessing this okay so uh, here I, I already have the access to such a, a file which I was downloading from the internet so from the website so you see the uh, I have an ISO file and I have the zip file which is already unpacked. So when I unpack the, uh, our image, then you have the one single file um, available and the two directories. The first directory is a boot, okay? And the second directory is the so-called build directory. So here there are uh, plenty files which belongs to this certain uh, software release. And the boot uh, mostly uh, do not change. There are some uh, small changes, but very, very minor. So in the boot directory, you will find the boot inst exe. And when you have already copied the file on your USB stick, then you can run the boot, boot inst exe and uh, boot in exe will uh, make the USB stick bootable. After um, you confirm the USB stick, then you can just save, remove, uh, 
click mid, mid uh, click on the left uh, mouse then you will be able to uh, remove this from your pc safely because uh, uh, just it is hot plug device but uh, removing this anytime uh, you have no guarantee that uh, Win windows operating system has really physically written all the data on this on the device good that we in this case we have uh, uh, already some points discussed i was planning also to discuss today very uh, quick uh, iSCSI and as best practices uh, we've got uh, such a uh, webinar uh, last time and we have discussed uh, these points and I would like a really very, very quick discussion about this today. So I will open another presentation which was uh, uh, as an agenda for, for the best practices and I would really um, tell about these uh, points um, in express way. So I will not really uh, discuss a lot. Uh, first, when you are planning a storage, um, you must make sure that you also plan kind of replication backup uh, that your data is really redundant. Don't be happy with the redundant hardware like let's say RAID array, you have some um, uh, how to say safety because uh, data let's say in RAID 1 or RAID 10 or RAID 5 are somehow redundant so one of the uh, disk is failing you still uh, can access your data but please do not believe that uh, or please do not assume that the RAID is everything what you need uh, actually the keep the data redundant is even much more important than um, keeping the hardware uh, redundant. So, uh, in the software we have uh, built-in uh, tools which are helping you to keep the data redundancy. So that's the built-in data replication, uh, that's the built-in volume replication, and that's built-in uh, backup uh, software, which is uh, just regular uh, incremental uh, archiving software. So that's the first point. The next point is uh, check your hardware health. Uh, don't believe, please, that the, your, hard, your hardware you just set is uh, really very good and then you just install the software and you can ship it at once. Um, in plenty cases, it, it can save your time and money when you will, let's say, uh, make a 24 hours or even uh, two days um, heavy duty test which will prove all your disk, all your memory and uh, your RAID controllers that everything works well. So you can make any uh, possible um, heavy duty test which is running some benchmark or running uh, uh, iSCSI uh, initializing. So let's say you have 10 terabyte storage, you create 10 terabyte iSCSI FIIO with uh, initializing or fiber channel um, volume with initializing even you don't need it but you will fulfill uh, everything and this will prove to you that all your hard disk everything is in a good quality okay next point is check your rate make sure that your rate is really working a way it is described so it will be good uh, to do some exercises whether your rate is really uh, working well so the exercises are like uh, removing um, so simulating the rate failure and uh, after simulating the rate failure also rebuilding the rate array making sure everything works well uh, good then uh, and it was uh, here uh, described in the, our uh, document that such a failure simulation uh, cannot cost that the open operating system will show some IO errors or this kind of stuff because the uh, failure with the hard disk need to be transparent for the operating system yeah uh, next uh, exercise which you need to do with the rate is uh, uh, 
in case that that's just advice later on when you are already in production and your customer is coming back to you with the problem uh, rate is degraded because one disk is failed. So here we have a very uh, practical procedure uh, what to do in such case. Okay, uh, hard disk failed, we need to replace it at once. No, no, no. Uh, the first point in such a case, you run fresh data backup. Second point, you make sure that the uh, backup can restore and the data are consistent. Okay? After you prove it, then next point, you can identify the uh, so problem of the source, of uh, source of the problem, and then you can find the faulty drive or uh, some other things and replace the faulty hardware. After replacing faulty hardware, then you can uh, start uh, rebuilding. So that's the point number five. So as, as this is po point number five, uh, it is not the point number one that you start, uh, let's say, uh, replace the hardware and start rebuild uh, like point two. So you see, uh, please make uh, be cool and in such a situation be also professional. And a professional means uh, think about data first. Okay, next uh, point which is uh, very important here, iSCSI and fiber channel volumes. Uh, sometimes happen that people don't understand what iSCSI fiber channel volumes is, is so-called uh, storage area network. It is SAN, so it is formatted by your uh, storage clients. And if uh, this is not really sharing, you can, let's say, uh, make one volume and uh, assign to your uh, VMware and make another volume and assign to your um, Windows server. But uh, in this case, uh, the, the one volume is, is assigned to uh, one host. In case of VMware, of course, two uh, VMware hosts can use the same volume because uh, VMware has a so-called uh, cluster file system. But please don't try to use, let's say, two Windows server uh, with NTFS accessing to the same uh, iSCSI volume because sooner or later, I will say even sooner, you will corrupt your data. If you want to share such a volume that two or more servers are uh, writing the data to the same um, SAN volume, then you need kind of a cluster file system. There are some available even for Windows. Okay. A multi storage unit. Our storage has a volume, logical volume manager built in so you can uh, add more storage units and you can spend them together. So if you have only one RAID controller, then you have one volume group and then you can have one logical volume or more logical volumes. There is no problem at all. But if you have, let's say, two RAID arrays and or even more and you must spend them together because let's say your first RAID array is 10 terabyte and your second RAID array, let's say external is another 10 terabyte but you need one 20, 20 terabyte volume. So you need to add the sec second um, unit to the same volume group. Okay, uh, this is nice, but what happens when external unit is missing? Also, the first cannot be mounted at all. So such a spanning uh, means that both of the parts must exist. If you will create two separate volume groups, then when one of them is missing, even first, you will be able to boot the storage uh, because we have the so-called uh, special um, system volume on every volume group. And when first volume group is missing, you can switch that now the second volume group is a main uh, boot storage. Okay, and then how to install, uh, we have discussed this already a little, but uh, this is also in the quick start, which I mentioned it. Currently, we are recommending to install our software on the two gigabyte uh, logical unit, which is uh, on your RAID controller. Or you can use, uh, let's say, I, um, ATA DOM, you can use SATA DOM, you can use some SSDs. 
even you can use also USB, but please use uh, only very good quality USB. Uh, we have decided not to use, uh, not to ship the software on uh, USB because uh, uh, in some cases it was a problem from coming from the uh, DOM. In some cases it was problem coming from the uh, main board. Uh, USB 2 uh, for the long term is not uh, always very reliable. So in such case we rather, uh, based on the experience uh, recommend what we recommend now. So please try to stick to this recommendation. Uh, what about volume size? Okay, we do not um, we do not recommend to create a, a single volume bigger than 64 terabytes today. This is uh, connected to the amount of um, RAM, so memory, uh, which is installed in your system. So we uh, recommend that when your uh, terabyte, when your uh, when your storage capacity in terabyte uh, divided by two is giving your uh, RAM size in uh, gigabyte. Let's say I have 64 terabyte. I supposed to have uh, 32 uh, gigabyte RAM. Why? Uh, because uh, this is very important in case of uh, file system repair. When we repair file system, uh, we need a lot of memory in order to get the job done. So if you do have the, let's say, 64 terabyte storage in total, but your volumes can be smaller size, let's say 16 terabyte each, then let's say you need in such case about 8 gigabyte RAM, but if you want everything in a single volume, please uh, be prepared that you need to have uh, more RAM installed in the system. We will, uh, in the future, uh, this problem uh, will be uh, solved, uh, but uh, this will be solved with the uh, different kind of file system. So far, the product is like this, and probably for the next I will say six, eight, ten months, uh, for sure it will not change. And also system uh, temperature, please uh, make sure that when your system running, let's say one day heavy duty job, the disks are not uh, becoming very hot. So if this is the case, your storage may be not reliable for the long term. So please make sure that, that the uh, disk which are running under heavy duty job uh, keep the regular temperature which is in spec from the, the, the disk manufacturer. Okay? And the last thing, um, be aware about chassis vibrations and the proper uh, disk labeling. You have maybe 16 drives or even more, make sure that the, the tray starts with the proper number. Some RAID array starts with 0, 1, 2, some starts with 1, 2, and uh, uh, some starts with the top right corner, some another starts from the uh, lower corner. It means the numbering of the disks uh, that every tray need to have a label. This is a tray 0, this is a tray 1, and when you re identify the drives properly on the RAID controller, make sure that this is really works because uh, if this uh, does not match then it will cost you a big big problem because let's say uh, rate controller will report that the port 3 is failed and somebody will remove port 6 in instead of port 3 for example uh, and uh, if possible, do not mix um, different RPM drives. Let's say you have 15,000 RPM drives. Do not mix them with the 7,000. Only in case when the manufacturer, uh, the chassis manufacturer confirm there is no problem. Or I will even test because the, it can be that the anti-vibration firmware in the hard disk is prepared to work with the 15,000 RPM drives and is not prepared with, uh, with vibration coming from 10,000 RPM drives, okay? That's all about the best practices, and let us come back to the, to the configuration and uh, user and task snapshots. 
data replication, volume replication, and uh, uh, some failover exercises. Okay, maybe some stop a little because uh, I would like to see the questions. Okay, how to... Uh, today we will not make any performance testing. Okay, I see plenty questions from uh, Dennis. Uh, okay, probably too many to uh, to answer them during the presentation. I will copy the questions uh, to my. Uh, to me or to my uh, precious colleagues, and we will try to answer these questions um, after the ve uh, uh, webinar, because there is plenty of them. Uh, but questions like how to increase write speed, yeah, <laughs> uh, there is uh, good, very good questions. Uh, there is plenty way to increase uh, write speed. Uh, of course, you can have a faster disk, but what does it mean faster disk? So instead of uh, 7,200 IPM disk, you can try with 10,000, you can try with, uh, uh, with uh, 15,000. Uh, yeah, depends what kind of write speed. Is it sequential write speed or is it, it is random write speed? If you want to really improve your random uh, write speed, then think about SSD. You can read my uh, our blog here, okay? When you go to uh, blog and open uh, then you can uh, find the article what you can expect from SSD. And in this article, uh, there is a short discussion. There are some uh, proposal. Let's say you can use uh, Adaptec um, Max Cache, or you can use LSI Cascade. A solution, so you are um, mixing SSD with SATA in within the RAID. Also, uh, we have made some exercises using uh, uh, RAID uh, with uh, Intel SSDs. That's these uh, cheap SSDs, uh, uh, which are uh, based on MLC te uh, technology. And, uh, but we've got very nice, uh, random, very good, positive, random uh, numbers. And, uh, okay, just uh, read, the, read the last few sentences, then you will see that the um, rate which is based on the SSD is uh, three to eight times faster. Uh, and it was the rate made on the four uh, SSD and I was comparing to the RAID array with 12, 15,000 uh, very fast, um, 15,000 RPM drives, and such RAID was, was uh, uh, at least three and the maximum uh, eight times faster than in a random I.O. Okay, so that's the way to go. Uh, next question. Can we have copy of uh, these notes? Of course, the, um, we are recording this. You will be able to access this. Uh, data backup from one DSS to another? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm going to talk about it um, a little today. Is it based on LVM? Yes, we are using Logical Volume Manager too. Uh, next question. Uh, can we use bootable CD? Yes, of course. You can use bootable CD to install the software. You can, uh, because the, we have a ISO file, so you can burn CD with the, uh, directly with ISO, and you have bootable CD. Next question. I want to replace local HDD of my server to iSCSI disk. I want to replace local HDD of my server with iSCSI disk. Yes, this is possible. Uh, in such case, you need a uh, Ethernet, which has a iSCSI boot firmware inside. So uh, Intel has uh, um, Ethernet uh, cards, which um, has uh, such a firmware. So mostly these server cards, you can just Google Intel iSCSI boot, and you will find the product. 
And next question. Okay, it was a gigabyte. Uh, okay, so I will say uh, uh, gigabyte and terabyte. Uh, again, I will repeat. Let's say you have 20 terabyte storage, so you need 10 gigabyte RAM. About. Okay. Next question, is there a way to use another backup agent other than free you support uh, natively? Uh, whoa. Uh, theoretically, yes, depends on the demand, but this which we are using are uh, most popular. Uh, this is why we have them. Of course, in order to back up your data, uh, you don't... Um, you don't must use an uh, agent, you can use, uh, you can just, there is plenty of software which you can just uh, mount the data and the backup. Of course, uh, using agent is, is a faster way, but so far we didn't manage, we are not able to add everything into our software. Okay. So far, okay. Uh, let us come back to the uh, presentation. So, now we are going to talk about uh, um, snapshots. Snapshot is an uh, important part of the uh, functionality because snapshots gives you option to replicate the data in production, the, in the live system. People are working all the time and you can every 10 minutes or every hour or every once a day or a few times a day, depends on the schedule, you can replicate your data and then you can replicate the delta of your da data, of course. So this is very efficient algorithm. You can replicate your data uh, in different directions. So you, we can replicate the data to server A and to server, so from server A to B and from A to C. And opposite, let's say on the uh, server 230, I have a one mission critical volume, which I'm replicating on the uh, next server. And on this server, um, people are working on different volume, and we are cross-replicating uh, to another volume on 230. So in such case, I will have the, let's say, one volume live data for me, and this data will be replicated on another server and I will have another volume where I keep the replicated data from another server. So there is plenty uh, options possible here because in data replication you just uh, enter the destination IP and, and it works. So uh, let us go to the volume manager, volume groups. And I will show you, I have already pre-configured everything. So let's say I have the one unit. So of course I applied and I created one um, volume group. It is a one only, so uh, looks a bit uh, not very rich, uh, but it is enough for our demonstration. And as you see, I have prepared already NAS volume. Uh, and with the NAS volume, I have created uh, also the snapshot, very small snapshot volume. I have created 10 giga only because I would like to demonstrate how the snapshot is fulfilling. So this is why it's easier to make it with the small size. And I have also block I.O. Uh, logical volume for my iSCSI failover demonstration. Okay, so NAS volume is created, snapshot is created. Uh, okay, the, the snapshot is created, snapshot is assigned, and let us go to create, uh, so to stop and start the snapshot and access the snapshot data. Uh, so first, I would want to show you how to use the snapshot, let's say, like so-called user snapshot. You want to have, let's say, two or three snapshots uh, starting uh, every morning or every lunchtime, and in such case you can have access to the historical data. So I go to uh, maintenance snapshot, and the, in the maintenance snapshot I see that the snapshot is 
uh, started already. Okay, so let me. Uh, this snapshot is started already. Uh, when this snapshot is started, I need to somehow export this snapshot over the uh, shares. So because this is a NAS volume, so I want to uh, export this over NAS share. So in NAS settings, uh, you see I am already connected to my uh, Active Directory services. So I made the connection. To not waste time, I have I'm connected already, and then when I go to shares, I have created one share which is a uh, name data, and another share with name snap 00. Okay, when I click on snap 00, the snap 00 is pointing to the logical volume because it is uh, behaving like the logical volume, and it is snap 00. How do I create such a share? So I just go to click on shares. When I create a, a share, I do not use a default FAT. I use specified FAT. It means I will tell uh, which exact part needs to be joined with my uh, share. So I'm just pointing snap 00. It is pointed, and now I will say, just for test, I will put test, okay? Test snap, for example. Okay, so now I have a, such a uh, name, and it is pointing to this uh, directory, okay? Apply. You see, I'm allowed to create as many shares as I want, uh, pointing to the same point. So test snap is pointing to snap 00, snapshot 00, and this is pointing to the same path. Of course, if I don't need to, I can remove it anytime. So just scroll down and remove it. Okay. Uh, this warning we exaggerate a little. Okay, because it is not really removing the any data, it is just removing this shell, which is a kind of link between your uh, point in, in directory and your network. Okay, so we have a shared data, and the shared data I already assigned myself here, you see, I'm on the list, and uh, snapshot share, so snap00 share, and I have I am listed as well. So I'm login as a uh, as my name. So I supposed to have access to these shares. So let me go to Explorer and try to access these shares. So my name is DSS230 and the first is data. Okay. No. Okay, so as you see, I have already copied some files. That's my test files. Okay, nice. Let me go to the when I go to the share snap zero zero. What happened? I see directory data. It because snap zero zero. It is showing the whole logical volume. So when I'm in the shared data, I see only the, the files which are inside. And w when I'm in the snap 00 share, then I see top of the logical volume. Okay, when I click in data, then I see what is exactly in the shared data inside. For the snap 00, the data is also a directory here inside. Good, and I have exactly the same thing. Uh, what happened uh, when I delete when I go back to the directory data I'm back in the directory data I can delete everything okay so some disaster happened I lost all my data good no problem at all I go to snapshot okay I go to my snapshot and 
go inside and I can copy everything. Control C, so I let's say copy, and then come back to the empty share data and I can copy it and I can paste it. Okay? Before I paste it, I want to show it how it works. So I go to snapshot and in the snapshot we see that we have already 10% in use. And what does it mean? I will start the copy right now. So paste. Okay, so it is copying the data, copying the data from the snapshot directory to my uh, another directory. So I'm reading and writing at the same time. And what happened here, let me close and open. You see it was 10, now it's 13.7. Okay. Okay, it is copying. So it's almost 18. 21. So you see, when I'm copying the data into the snapshot, the usage of this snapshot is growing. Uh, I told you I made a very small uh, snapshot size, so I took only 10 giga, um, because now you will see uh, that the percentage is really growing when I'm copying the data. So now the data are already copied. So what happened? Uh, I'm using 26.9, almost 27% uh, of the space which was assigned to the f uh, snapshot functionality uh, is already used. When I will get to the 100%, my snapshot will become inactive. So I will, will be not able to see my historical data. So now I'm in the uh, data and when I, something happened with my data again, okay, maybe I will not uh, delete everything, I will just delete one file. Uh, when uh, this file was uh, actually the, the biggest one, one giga, I delete it again. So when I come back to the uh, to the snapshot, okay. Let me see. DSS. Okay, sorry. DSS. Uh, 230 snap okay uh, the, in, of course in the snapshot the file is is there so I can copy this one more time and I can now I'm back in my data good and I can copy it back so paste uh, it was the biggest file so probably I will see again the change here. So we have some more uh, space used now. Uh, be careful when you will copy your data back from the snapshot and you are about 90% or more, then during the copy you can kill the snapshot and then you will be, you will lose the source. So in such case you can't, you can't copy your data back, uh, to the original location. You, you need to find out different location and then uh, when you are safe you can copy back um, to the system and then fulfill the snapshot. So this is a, kind of danger, but if your space which is assigned to the snapshot is big enough, it should not happen, yeah? So, think about it. Okay, what happened when I stop the snapshot? When I stop the snapshot, I am not able to access my snapshot data anymore. 
So what happens when I go to the Explorer? I'm in the share data. Everything works well. There is no problem at all. I'm fine. And what happens when I go to Snap? Of course, I have a problem at once because this directory doesn't exist. This folder doesn't exist anymore. Okay? So, I don't have it. When I start the snapshot one more time, there is a nice uh, error message here because I have already defined a replication task and when I'm starting uh, manually a task which is assigned to the replication task, I get an error message, of course, because starting the snapshot manually has a higher priority for the system than the task. So if the task will want to use the snapshot, we will see an error. I will show you this error uh, because this is good for uh, uh, just learning how the product works. So I start the snapshot. Okay, it takes a few seconds uh, until the snapshot is started and we'll see the start time here. Okay, it started. So now, when I try it one more time, I can access already. And you see, I can see, uh, I can see, okay, I can't see still. You need to be patient because uh, uh, such a creation in network need to be propagated and it may take a few seconds uh, until you will be able to access this. Okay, let us wait for this. Okay, still not. Hopefully yes now. Still not. Okay, sorry about it. Snapshot is started. I should get access in the second. Okay, snapshot is zero. Data. Aha, I know already what happened. Uh, I don't have access. I, I will wait longer time and I don't have access. So it is nice um, that we show it because uh, you will know how to find the problem. Let us check what's going on with our share. So let us go to the shares and let us check the, the share data. Uh, which is pointing to our uh, logical volume and the directory data and what happened with the mm, snap zero zero okay it is still pointing so probably aha because i was not uh, i was not deleting i was just stopping the snapshot so actually it is, uh, I, I, uh, I was thinking I was uh, deleting the snapshot, but, but I didn't. Okay. Yes, it looks like TSS 230 snap 00. I I see I have problem data okay that's the data for sure and that's the 
snap zero zero. Oh, sorry. So now it really works. Uh, maybe it was some uh, problem with the server that the uh, propagating this uh, was uh, taking longer. We have workaround. Uh, if you are very unpatient, uh, we have a workaround which can go in maintenance connections. Uh, you can make it at once when you click reset SMB connections. But in such case, uh, if somebody is just connected, will be disconnected for the short while. Mostly it is not a b uh, critical disconnecting for the short while, but we have such a warning because it may be a problem. Uh, who is connected, you can see in status connections. And in the status connections, you see that's okay. Uh, that's the connected uh, person on this PC. That, that's uh, right, my PC. And I'm connected to this share at this moment. Okay, so now uh, I'm connected to this uh, share and that's my data again. And what happened with the snapshot uh, usage I will be near to zero because I have just started this snapshot right now. So when I started snapshot right now and I didn't create new data, so the snapshot usage is zero. And that's normal. And I, I still want to show you one more thing. Uh, this is very, very important. I will come back to my share. Okay, I'm back in my webinars and again I'm going to delete all my data. Yes, so the snapshot was active. I deleted all my data and the snapshot usage almost, or in our case, it doesn't show any change. And I have deleted data. Why snapshot usage? didn't change. Uh, the answer is very easy because uh, deleting the data doesn't create a lot of physical changes on the blocks because it is just marking the files that are deleted. So the physical changes on the storage is very small. Let me uh, copy the data back from the snapshot. Okay. I'm back in the snapshot. I will copy the data and the come back to my okay, that's empty share. And I'm copying uh, the data back again. So now it is copying the data back, so now I will see again that it's really a usage of this snapshot is growing. The way how it works, and now you can plan the size of your snapshot properly. So let's say if your snapshot is a daily snapshot, and when you expect, let's say, 10 giga changes every day, so make the snapshot size at least twice, maybe even three times bigger. So you expect 10 giga, assign, let's say, 30, 40, even 50 giga for the snapshot, and then you will have rather guarantee that it never happened, that it will be overloaded. Again, when your snapshot is supposed to be started once a week, okay, so you expect 10 giga every day, time fives, five days, so you expect maybe 50 giga a week, make it, make it three times bigger or five times bigger, so make 250 gig for snapshot. As a disk space is very cheap today, so no problem. You can make a storage and you can assign uh, enough space for snapshot. And uh, profit from the access to the historical data. Okay, so we see we have a something like 24 about uh, storage usage and if we again delete this data uh, then um, the usage will not really change. But that's enough about showing the 
the snapshot, I would like to come back to a replication. The snapshot is started and I want to show you this error. So when I go to uh, data replication, so the data replication is already enabled and I enable the data yeah. replication on the NAS settings and uh, data replication agent. It is enabled, of course, on, on both server because on the secondary server I have created a share which will uh, receive the data replication. So I created the share data replication and this data replication share is also enabled for uh, data replication means that that's my destination and on destination I need to agree to receive uh, the replication data. So I put this uh, box here activated and I enter the login name admin and the password was also admin. Good. So coming back to our volume replication task, data replication, I have created such a task already. That's very easy creating the task because I just enter the task name, let's say RR, I enter my source, I enter my snapshot. Okay. Here you will see how important it is that every task has a private snapshot because, uh, let's say, zero, uh, snapshot 00, zero I'm using for my user snapshot, which, let's say, I want to start once a day. And I take the same snapshot for uh, replication. Okay, my destination is uh, the next server. I check for the shares. Okay, one is found. It means one was already enabled for the replication and that's the re replication data. I put a, a login name admin. I put the password admin, okay, to make easy. And I use the standard parameters. Good. So I have another task. Actually, both tasks are identical. So I don't need two identical tasks. So let me remove one of them, which I don't need. Okay, let me start this task. I'm starting this task. And somehow I see there is no start time. Let me see to the status tasks. Okay, so you will see that the task which I still started right now cannot create snapshot because snapshot is probably created. Yeah, uh, that's why the error because our snapshot which uh, we have started manually and which we were planning, let's say, to schedule once a day. When I click here, I, I have access to the schedule. And this schedule was, let's say, I wanted to have it every day, uh, even weekend, at, let's say, 5 a.m. in the morning, every week, of course. I, and I put only, only start time. It means no stop time. It will stop the next day at 5 a.m. one second before, of course, uh, or actually at 5. It will stop, and then a few seconds later, it will start. Okay, it means this task will always, every 24 hours, will renew the snapshot. Okay, if you need, uh, um, Let's say one snapshot at 5 a.m., another at um, lunchtime, you need to create another snapshot that will be snapshot 001 and assign another schedule, okay? But of course, we, we don't need this now because now we want to change our mind and we want to use it as a replication task. By meantime, I can create more snapshots and be happy, but uh, for this demo, we'll just uh, stop this uh, snapshot to show that we will solve the problem with the replication task which cannot start, okay? And the replication task, data replication, okay? When I want to start manually, I click here. When I want to assign the schedule, which will be normal the case, uh, you will put the schedule here, whether it is interval every certain time or this is a calendar-based, same like I just shown. So, let us start the task manually. 
I start the task manually and the task is starting. I will see the start uh, right now. When I go to status, I will see that the uh, task is starting the snapshot by itself. So you see the start snapshot is right now started. Replication task is right now started. And uh, because I don't have a lot of data, uh, it will be stopped within a few seconds. So, uh, and uh, it will be stopping the snapshot, of course, within a few seconds automatically. So it is, uh, okay, now we see it's done. Uh, so this uh, replication was replicating uh, this kind of number of files and that was the um, average speed, okay? Good. Uh, the last, uh, what I wanted to show, and we have to do it very fast, it is iSCSI volume replication. So, so as we have seen on the chart, we have two virtual IP. And uh, in order to configure two virtual IP, we need to go to the iSCSI failover and on interface ETH1, you see we have the virtual IP. Of course, we have identical virtual IP on the secondary server. Right, ETH1. I have identical configuration here on the secondary server, right? The only thing what is not identical on the secondary server I enter for the so-called auxiliary connection, it means for the heartbeat connection, I enter IP from the first server, and on my first server I enter IP from the 1240 secondary server. But the virtual IP is, cause, of course, identical. The same, on the next card I assign another virtual IP. We can assign virtual IP on any card, or we can assign on more cards. Uh, what is important here, on these cards where is virtual IP, we need these cards uh, to be protected by ping node. So the please note that our ping node is in subnet 1 and in subnet 2. Coming back to the chart, here we have ETH1, which is in the subnet 1, and we have ETH2, which is in subnet 2. So on these two physical, not the virtual, but on the physical subnet 1 and 2, we will have our ping nodes. Good. You see, when I go to iSCSI failover configuration, and I show you the configuration, okay, I was assigning only two ping nodes in the subnet 1 and in the subnet 2. And please note the 1, 6 and 1, uh, 2, 6. Uh, that is, uh, one of them is uh, um, actually, uh, both of them can be de uh, defined even on my uh, server, which I'm using right now as the alias. So when you go to the uh, network settings, in the network settings, sorry, not the diagnose, but the settings. In the network settings, you can go to uh, manage net connections, and here in properties, okay, uh, we go to the version 4 and advanced, and in advanced you see that the, let's say 2.6, uh, it is a ping node, it is a IP for my ping node configured on my server, because my server is in 06 subnet, but I can add another alias IP uh, and both are available. So this is a proof I can use any server also for the, uh, as a ping node. Uh, this server is running, of course, 24 hours, right? It is um, uh, available all the time, but uh, in order to be sure that at least one of the ping node is available, you can configure two, three, or four, right? Uh, good, so we have the configuration, iSCSI configuration ready. The step-by-step -step is available um, on 
are our plenty of our presentations and actually uh, this presentation which is uh, showing how to configure iSCSI failover, uh, failover with a two uh, virtual IP for MPIO you will find on our library and uh, in the library just go to how to resources and in the how to resources in open e data replication you will find very fresh 2011 February open e DSX v6 how to set up iSCSI failover with Xen server uh, how to set up failover whether it is for Xen or VMware is identical and uh, in this presentation we have shown also how to set up uh, MPIO on the Xen server okay so you have a full step by step here because of the uh, too less time I cannot show every detail on this presentation I will show you that the primary active is already running uh, properly and on the secondary server we have of course uh, iSCSI failover secondary passive right and here my client uh, Xen server uh, in the Xen server you see this iSCSI virtual disks uh, that's the uh, disk which is connected to the uh, with multipath because when I click here the two paths are available uh, it is connected to uh, to the iSCSI with 192.168.10.250 but actually the second path which is on uh, 22.150 is of course active because our target is uh, uh, working in uh, in so-called portal mode it means all the available IP are exported and available okay and we have just uh, started one uh, Windows 2008 server which is running you see on iSCSI virtual disk so that's the proof that's the disk uh, that's the uh, virtual machine which is running on our iSCSI good so I have also access of the console to this uh, virtual machine okay let me log in that's the machine and I can let's say make some copy job working here okay maybe I will access my uh, NAS open e server okay and I can just copy some images some old images okay few of them copy and I can just paste them to my documents good so while I'm copying the data I can switch now to um, our iSCSI failover server and that's the secondary of course you see I don't have manual failover when I go to the primary I see we have a manual failover button let us click it okay so we are now switching uh, I will make it a bit smaller okay we see already that the first is in the suspend mode so the second must be already in active mode so primary active and when I switch to our virtual machine so virtual machine is running without any problem okay and then we can start feedback okay before we start feedback of course we need to sync the volumes when we sync the volumes then we will start the volume replication task which is synchronizing the data back to the primary server uh, because by meantime uh, it is starting already by meantime we copy some data on the virtual machine so we, we we made very small changes on the storage okay let us see oh it was very small because the uh, task is even consistent I, I suppose to click on this button a bit um, faster so when this is consistent then we are ready to uh, feedback okay when I click on feedback then let us observe the the server 
which is still running fine. Okay, and uh, I can also ping. It will be good demo when I ping. I log into the um, Xen server, okay, console. Ping 192.168.10.250. Okay. It is pinging all the time without any problem. My server is copying the data without any problem. And this node is in passive by meantime. And primary is back active. Okay. So uh, it works well. Uh, no problem at all. It is transparent for the uh, Xen server or VMware or Windows, uh, any user you have. Uh, same thing when I switch off power from the primary server or when I just update the primary server and uh, reboot the primary server. So that will be working exactly the same way. So let's say uh, I will reboot the primary server. So I go maintenance and the shutdown and restart the system. So it will just it is just prompting me that, the, of course, this belongs to the iSCSI failover. Do I really want it? You can imagine that by meantime, I went to the software update and updated to the new build, right? When I have updated to the new build, then I can, uh, then the new build will be by default as a, uh, as a next default. Uh, I can switch this default build clicking on this button, you see. When I click here, do you want to uh, set this as a next start? As I say yes. So this checkpoint, uh, checkbox will move here. Now after reboot, I will run to this version. This one is uh, our next in engineering version, which I'm trying from time to time. So when I leave like this, it will reboot with this new version. But let's say I stay with my a regular official version and click on shutdown and uh, restart. Uh, okay, for sure when I will ping to this uh, 230, so ping 192.168.0.250, okay, so soon I will lose the, the ping when I restart. And let us see by meantime what the virtual machine is of course running all the time without any problem. I'm restarting the first machine so the pink uh, will stop to answer uh, in a few seconds and I see that there is a problem already uh, it is time out and that's of course normal because the, this machine is uh, rebooting so we have a proof that it is uh, no more in the service but of course our our virtual machine uh, did not notice anything so I can browse my uh, browse my uh, software and I can go to buy the product, right? So, and of course here when I will just refresh, I have problem because this machine doesn't exist anymore. It's just rebooting. So the, the second node as expected is active and uh, I still cannot uh, click on the sync volumes until the first machine is back because when I click on the sync I will just get the error message that the machine is not available. Okay, unable to communicate because this is um, not uh, up and running yet. But so, uh, soon will be back and then you can click on the sync and fail back uh, and then the cluster will be again in redundant mode. Okay, so uh, I'm done with the demo for today. 
let me check the questions and uh, let us answer the questions which came by meantime. Uh, the next question was, what FTP server you use? Pro FTP? Yes, we use Pro FTP. Okay. Oh, it was before another question. Uh, uh, what, uh, when snapshot become 100%, it will be accessible? Yeah, I, I was showing it was not accessible. Uh, Next question, I would prefer the Windows uh, uh, Windows Shadow Copy service. Okay, Windows Shadow Copy is a very similar service to this what we have right now. But of course, um, if you like it and you know how to use it, uh, no problem at all. Especially when you use iSCSI. Next uh, question, does taking snapshot take more resources if done in open it through VMware. So, of course, when uh, one snapshot is started or two or three or five, it is still not problem, but when you start, let's say, 10 snapshots, then you will see that the right performance is already somehow maybe 40% uh, degraded. So, uh, running uh, many snapshots simultaneously is slowing down your system. But in Windows, uh, in uh, Shadow Copy, it is the same problem. Okay, the next uh, question, it was about FTP, yeah, that was answered already. Uh, next question, does snapshot takes only differential of data, incremental changes? So the, how the snapshot works, again, we have the uh, presentation in our uh, library. And under snapshots, you will see here, that's the description, how it works. It is not so obvious, maybe, but uh, the snapshot is the block-based. And when you see starting the snapshot takes only a few seconds, and the stopping, stopping the snapshots as well. So snapshot works this way that when you have, let's say, 1000 giga volume and the 100 giga snapshot. So when you start, when you assign the snapshot, since this time volume manager has a 1000, 100 giga piece to manage. It shows to the user still 1000 giga, exactly your live volume. And when you start the snapshot, it will keep the extra amount and it will also show only 1000 giga in the snapshot. But for keeping all these uh, double files, which uh, double blocks, which need to be kept, let's say your delta, data are deleted in the in the live volume and you uh, see it as a free space, but no, no, uh, for the operating system, for the file system, they need to keep this data in the snapshot to be ready to, to copy. So a system needs some extra space for such a, uh, operation, and this is why we are assigning a space for the snapshot functionality. As more you assign, then your more changes you can keep, right? Next question, how do you set up time snapshot? Uh, for example, create a snapshot that starts at specific time and at and, and another time. So, here I was showing that we have the schedule uh, when we have a snapshot, then uh, for for this, okay, that's the second server, and I didn't define. I hope that by meantime the first is already back. That's true. And I can show you, I was showing this, that you can create a schedule for the snapshot, and when you have a schedule for the snapshot, it is not worthy to define the stop time because when let's say you want the snapshot to be active for the whole week then you start monday let's say 1 a.m in the night in the morning and apply in such case this is just wait a second and this is this schedule is coming here 
okay, weekly, Monday 1 a.m. in the morning, and there is no stop, stop time, means next week at 1 a.m. in the morning, it will be recreated, right? So this snapshot, when will be enough uh, space assigned to the snapshot, w you will have last week data, because let's say today is Tuesday, you go inside this snapshot and you will see exactly uh, the status of Monday 1 a.m. in the morning, so when you made some changes in, in Sunday or Saturday, you will see, it, see this. If you delete this data uh, during the Monday or Tuesday day, you still have them accessible in this snapshot. Okay, so the defining stop is, uh, is, is, is doesn't make sense here, because you want to keep this as, as long as possible. Good, so next question. Mm. Oh, uh, one more time, if you want more snapshots, let's say uh, weekly at 1, 1 a.m. in the morning in every Monday, you, can, you want to have weekly Tuesday, weekly Wednesday, and so on. So you can have uh, for every uh, weekday, you can have such a weekly snapshot, right? Then in such case, you will have seven copies behind you uh, um, available for access. And next, does the replication also apply to the iSCSI target? No, the, the, the data replication, that's the only data replication which is only for NAS. So for iSCSI or for Fiber Channel, we don't have data replication, so we only have volume replication. But volume replication we have also for NAS. So volume replication is for any NAS, data replication is for really files. So NAS. Next question. Can snapshots be offloaded to USB external dry or another volume? No, the snapshots can work only on the local storage. Uh, does OpenEV6 Lite support Windows 2008 as a domain controller? Uh, we do not provide a service as a domain controller. We only connect to the Active Directory, and uh, when we connect to the Active Directory, then we collect the user from the Active Directory. So you see, I have users and groups from the Active Directory, so when I configure my shares, I can use the same users which are already on the Active Directory. And that's all what we need Active Directory for, to get the user and groups database from the Active Directory. But we are not replacing Active Directory. Next question. This question is already answered. Okay. Would you advise to configure the used switched for both storages? Uh, Probably the question is that whether the switches can be used for the ping node, I guess. Yes, you can use the switches for the ping node if, if you think this in this question. If not, please repeat the question. Next question, if can then see the pr procedure where I can read about iSCSI multipath. Okay, as I already mentioned, uh, these uh, presentation which is um, uh, just posted to our uh, how to resources uh, showing exactly step by step. There is also more presentations which are with, made together with VMware or just with uh, Windows 2008. In open ear applications you have plenty of presentations. Uh, what is the best method for failover with Hyper-V? Okay, with Hyper-V uh, currently, uh, we have problem uh, because we do not replicate the persistent reservation. So during failover, uh, there will be uh, unfortunately problem. So please wait until we provide the uh, replicated persistent reservation. This will take another few months. We are just uh, finishing the uh, coding because the, the coding was made, but we 
after uh, code review, we made uh, plenty changes, and uh, we are still working on the code. Once this is ready, we will uh, make it available as soon as possible. By meantime, you can use iSCSI as a single for the Hyper-V without any problem. Next question. Can, can I check storage working properly or not in Open eConsole? In Open eConsole, you can see quite few things. Uh, but whether everything works properly, uh, you can... We have an API, so in the setup administrator, there are some commands which you can uh, issue and uh, check some settings, but not everything. Uh, whether storage is working properly, you can, of course, have some demons uh, checking your volumes. And using the API, you can also uh, ask about status of plenty of things. So, when I have here this API, I already added, uh, added the password and I already generated and downloaded the key. I can go and I can use the some commands in uh, some commands to check the uh, to check the storage. Okay, CD API. I have uh, here, uh, you can use SSH, but in my system, SSH doesn't work. Uh, this is 64 bit system. I downloaded the P link. And in the test batch, okay, I have some uh, commands. So there is a small difference between P link and SSH. Because in peeling, uh, okay, in SSH, which is described in our online help, uh, you use a, such a command uh, syntax, minus i, path to the uh, key, minus 2, minus small uh, p, and in peeling we use a capital P. And, uh, that's only the difference, actually. Okay, so here I'm using a capital P, and when I run this test batch, Okay, then first it was a help, and the second was a uh, test command. You see, I will show you one more time. So the first, I uh, uh, run the help command, and second, I run the test command. So this is, a, if I run just helling from the keyboard, minus E, okay. Um, Windows has a nice uh, function, tab key. It will just complete the command for you. So minus 2, minus P, and the port is 1, 1, 2, okay. The port is exactly the port which is configured on the GUI, okay. So the user minus L and the user is a fixed user API, IP 192.168.0.230, okay. And the command, let's say help, it is just showing the commands. Uh, for example, uh, let's say I want to uh, start the snapshot from this uh, command. So I put help snapshot task. Okay, I start it. So it is showing me the syntax. The syntax is a start or stop or status and the snapshot name. So let me put a start, or let me see whether this snapshot is started or not. So the snapshot here is not started. Okay, snapshot start. And the snapshot name is snap uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, I'm trying to start this snapshot, and again I'm getting a message that this snapshot is used by uh, tasks. So uh, it is rather not recommended to start, but if I uh, want to really start, I can just use a minus F for force. And this will really uh, try to start the snapshot uh, from API. So it takes few seconds and the snapshot will be started. 
you see the snapshot is uh, magically started uh, without uh, touching the GUI and then again the same I can just stop it I can stop it the snapshot okay and let us observe and the snapshot is stopped uh, magically from the API so we see uh, thanks this API you can also sta put status okay uh, status okay it is answering uh, then snapshot is in use but it is not active when I start it again okay and the wait of course for the while As, uh, what happened when I put the status right now so I see the answer is active so this is kind of uh, method of using this again um, uh, we uh, have the document in the library which is uh, describing how to use uh, this so in others we have um, or oh, in snapshots sorry in snapshots we have the document which is a remote snapshot control with API it shows based on the uh, snapshot example how to use MPI but of course uh, uh, you can just issue the help command and you can find out how the commands works okay let, next question okay uh, for failover I want to configure ETH1 on both DSS to run in separate network physical to replicate and then uh, present the failover virtual IP on the ETH0 yes it is enough to use only two cards in your setup you can configure the system uh, with two cards without any problem so on the first card you can have the uh, data access and on the second card you can have the data replication and the data replication will re uh, recommend direct connection so when when I see when I show you the uh, okay the chart again so in the chart you will see that the uh, in the chart you can see uh, that the for the data replication we prefer and recommend direct connection this is uh, very important because even in if switches are defected uh, so the failed uh, the uh, switches are failed uh, then communication uh, is uh, preserved by direct collection and then there will be no reason to make a fa an unwanted failover okay and also separation of the data access and uh, volume replication on the two NICs is a very good idea and as I mentioned it is enough to make uh, to have uh, two cards um, for the um, iSCSI anyway we had such a presentation with two cards only okay so I see that all questions are answered right now so I would like to uh, thank you very much for uh, joining our webinar today and I hope uh, to see you uh, next time on the next um, webinar